I don't know, maybe I'll work something around it. Um, okay, uh, so, hello everybody, it's, uh, Big Jack Films here. Welcome to the first Inuyasha vlog. Um, and this is mostly starting off, obviously, for people who are on Patreon. Uh, this is a first for you, so you guys get to see this first, and then everybody on YouTube will see this later. So, um, yeah, welcome to the series of vlogs. Uh, it is the 20th anniversary of my favorite anime series, Inuyasha. Uh, it started airing in 2000. And then it ended up uh, finishing up in 2004, and then got a revival with the final season in 2011. So, this series of vlogs um, are basically me going through every episode of the show, very much on par with Doug Walker's uh, Last Airbender vlogs. I will also be discussing the movies. Um, I will not be discussing the manga, uh, because I want to focus on the show only, even though I've read the manga, the manga's great. So... Uh, this, this episode, the first episode of the show, we're going to be talking about the first four episodes of Inuyasha, and these are a four-part continuous arc, and, uh, that's normally how I'm going to be doing these, is basically talking about the arcs of each episode, so that way it cuts my time a little bit, and I can talk about a bunch of episodes at once. So, uh, these are also, like, opening nights, so you can see me basically talk about this as sort of like a movie in a way. So, I guess I should start off, first of all, by saying... What my first um, time looking at the show ever was. Now, if you guys remember, there's a robot chicken skit where this dad, voiced by Seth MacFarlane, uh, is trying to wants to watch a football game, and his daughter's watching Inuyasha on Adult Swim, which is how a lot of people were exposed to it. Even though here in Canada we had Bionics, and I would watch the show every uh, evening at eight thirty before I went to bed. So his first reaction is basically just what the fuck? And that was me! That was me the first time watching this show. I, the first episode I watched, which we will get to more in detail, is the Subaki arc. I believe it's around season two? Season one or season two? At the very end of season one or the beginning of season two? I'm not 100%. I haven't, I'm haven't. i still watching the show as I go along making these vlogs, but um, the first thing I ever saw was Kagome holding her arrow at Inuyasha in the shed. She looked really dark, like, run Inuyasha, and all, all that jazz. And my first impression was, who is this Sailor Jupiter-looking girl pointing a bow and arrow at this weird old lady with dog ears? That was my first impression, and I remember it was, it was a late night, and I was flicking through the channels, uh, and I just spotted this, and then I told my friends about it later in school, and they're like, Oh, this is Inuyasha, this is the greatest show ever, I'm like, Inuyasha? What? Um, so eventually I, they told me to watch the show certain times to watch it, and I'm like, okay. So I watched the next episode, and I'm like, what the fuck are you guys watching? And then as I went on and on and on, I got really hooked on it, and I, it's become an addiction, it's my favorite television series of all time, characters, world building, all that jazz. Uh, and it just spun from there, and... It's great to kind of go back and kind of watch it again for the 20th anniversary especially. So I had a friend of mine uh, come in and we watched the first four episodes. So we're here to talk about how the show officially began. So basically the show opens. Obviously you have your anime uh, opening and closings, which I'll get to maybe in the next uh, ep video. But the show pretty much opens in feudal Japan where we see this thief character, Inuyasha, uh, which, watching the English dub, is voiced by the very talented Canadian Richard Ian Cox, uh, stealing this ancient gem, and, you know, he's like, hooray, I'm going to be, you know, full demon at last, and there's this big chase scene, uh, great music by the great uh, Karawanda, and then this priestess comes out, shouts his name, shoots the arrow, shoots a bow and arrow at him, pins him to a tree, and he essentially dies there. You're like... Wow, okay, this is an interesting way to start. And he drops the jewel, and the jewel, you know, is safe for now. Uh, the best way I could describe this scene in future hindsight, I'm just going to play the clip and put a popular song in it. Inuyasha! <laughs> that pretty much sums up the opening scene. So... Basically, as he's essentially dead, I guess, is from your first impression, then you have this girl, this priestess, who essentially is bleeding out, and you're like, oh my god, it's the first episode, we already have blood. Like, we had explosions and shit before, but now we have blood, oh my god. 
Um, so she's basically badly wounded. Her name is Kikyo. She's an ancient priestess um, with spiritual powers and, you know, can cast spells. So she's kind of like a mage, I guess. And if that's the case, I guess Inuyasha is a thief. That's his class, <laughs> essentially. Uh, if you're going to compare it to, like, a LARP or uh, RPG. So Kikyo dies. Um, her sister, Kaede, her young sister, uh, she, Kikyo orders her sister, Kaede, to... Bury, bur have the the jewel burned with her body so that it can never fall into the hands of people again. That's like, but then it's weird because later on in the show we this jewel's in almost indestructible. So it's like, what's the point of burning it if it's just gonna come back? Like you might as well like this thing's essentially like the One Ring of of Mordor essentially. And then to put the I'm gonna make a lot of comparisons to the Lord of the Rings in these logs, but. You know, it's your simple thing. You know, you have your quest, you have your MacGuffin, that's an evil entity that has to be destroyed. Um, so you think you might as well just throw this in a volcano and the problem solved. You know, I don't know why burning it is really such a big deal. So that's the first, like, two minutes, is Thief, uh, thief steals a jewel, girl shoots him with an arrow, pins him to a tree for eternity, and then she dies, and burns, and they cremate her like Kwai Kon Shin. Um, and you're just like, oh my god, why is all this happening? So, that leads into the title of our first episode, which is a very odd title. The Girl Who Overcame Time and the Boy Who Was Just Overcome. Way too long of a title for the first episode! I don't know, I would have called it, you know, I don't know, pinned to a tree. I don't know, something like that. Something a little bit more catchy. Um, so now we enter uh, regular Japan, Tokyo. Uh, it's the present day from this uh, series timeline. It would be about 2000, because even though the manga, yes, I know the manga does take place in 96, 97. Technically, with finger glitches. Um, but the show, we're going to make it canonized where it takes place in the year 2000. Uh, Present day 2000, not like any kind of futuristic shit. It's not like Blade Runner or Akira, essentially. So we cut to this uh, girl, this girl named Kagome. She's just had her 15th birthday, and her family owns this ancient shrine. It's a family heirloom. It has temples. It has uh, a, a, a big, huge tree that's like, a th like thousands of years old. And then you have this really creepy well. I'm like, okay, this well's been around forever. Nobody's thought to go down there? Okay. So, you know, her grandpa's kind of this Master Roshi, not perverted type like Master Roshi, but he's more like, I'm full of history, and Kagome's just like, not half as full as you are. The jokes are actually really funny in this. So anyway, so she, the first few episodes I will point out, Kagome does do a lot of exposition, kind of recaps in between what's going on so it's easier for the viewer, which I'm okay with. Um, there are times it gets a bit annoying, especially if you're binge-watching it, but it's fine. Because remember, this was supposed to be airing throughout a weekly period when it first came out. So, she, they own this shrine. It's her 15th birthday. She's about to go to school. Uh, she goes to high school. Typical uh, anime girl in this sense, uh, main character. And her brother Sota is at the Bone Eater's Well, and apparently the cat, Buyo, has gone into the well. And you're like... Oh shit, okay, and it's already creepy enough, this well. So, Buyo's just fucking around, Kagome goes down to the well, and then all of a sudden there's this spiritual shit, and these tentacle hands kind of grab her like Sigourney Weaver and Ghostbusters, and she falls into the well, and you're like, oh, we're getting into, okay, so this is hentai shit, oh no, 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 let's not go there. So, the first two minutes address blood, okay, so it's a very violent show, and Kagome is sucked into this well, into this weird kind of bright blue Doctor Who energy portal thing. It looks like the hyperspace travel in Star Wars, or something out of, like, Doctor Who. And all of a sudden, she's grabbed by this weird centipede lady monster with titties! And that, that was my... And again, like, you know, like, if you're a newcomer to the show, you not only get blood, <laughs> but to quote... Uh, Plankton in Spongebob when he goes to the alternate timeline here on the Krusty Krab and Mr. Krabs is Plankton. It's like, good grief, she's naked! <laughs> oh, God. So it's like, for a lot of newcomers, especially people who have never watched a real more mature anime, you're just like, holy shit. Um, so this 
weird centipede monster, that's the actual human centipede, um, basically, you know, says, I want the jewel, get out of and it does, like, this tongue thing, you're like, ugh, this is some alien shit right here. Um, so Kagome basically gets out of her path with some weird light thing, and then she's in an empty well. And... Of course you come up here when I'm talking about the show. Hi, Timber. Um, this might be a recurring occurrence here on the show, people. Come here, girl. Come on, sit down. Come on. Come on, come on the couch. So anyway, so she's trapped in the well, and uh, basically she's like, huh, what the fuck was that? Was I on the drugs or something? Uh, but then there's obviously the hand of that monster. She's like, oh, shit. So she climbs out of the well, and then all of a sudden she's in feudal Japan. And... Honestly, when they were first dubbing this show, the English dub by Ocean Studios, uh, I guess they were trying to find their feet in what to say and do. So, Monica Story, who voices Kagome, uh, does this really funny line, obviously paying tribute to Wizard of Oz, where she says, I could be wrong, but Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Tokyo anymore. But come on, you gotta do better than that! You gotta be, you gotta, like, look, I have a dog right here, come here, Timber. And you gotta be like Dolphy, you gotta be like Dolphy, like, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Tokyo anymore. We must be over the rainbow. And there's a bit of there's always Wizard of Oz rel relevances in anime and, and Japanese media. Like even like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers had Wizard of Oz. But to the point. So she has no idea where the hell she is. She still thinks she's in her time. I guess it overgrown. Like I don't see why because there's like all this overgrown shit. And she comes across the, the ancient tree where Inuyasha is pinned and is still. His body's still essentially very, uh, alive. Um, he has not aged a day. So, obviously, that spell, that arrow that was pierced him, was not a killing spell. It was more of a... It's what's called the Well of Sealing, or the Spell of, uh, the spell of Sealing, where, um, you basically pin this person to a tree, and he's in an internal sleep until the person who placed that spell can, uh, take out the arrow and revive him. So he's under a, 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 this whole sleep, and she goes up to him, and she's, she has no clue that this guy's pretty much dead, as, like asleep as in dead, like sleeping beauty shit. And all of a sudden, she starts playing with his ears, which were like these little dog ears. At first, I thought they were cat ears. So, but it turns out they're dogs. So she's got these dog ears. Which, what kind of dog would have those? I guess he's kind of part husky in a way, or wolf. But we'll get to that in a sec. So anyway, so I'll just demonstrate with Timber here. Come here, girl. Come here. So she's like, ooh, dog ears, I think I want to touch him. And he's like, whoop, 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 whoop. And it makes that sound effect. I guess that's supposed to imply cuteness. And then she's captured by the villagers, and then we meet up with this really old eye patch pirate priestess lady who I just call a uh, Japanese Uncle Ruckus because this lady turns out to be Kayede, who is a little sister to Kikyo, and some time has gone by, and she basically has one eye at an eye patch and all old and shit, so she's kind of like a mix of Yoda and Uncle Ruckus from the Boondocks, which is hilarious. So, um, basically they're taking care of her, they're wondering where the hell she came from, and what's happened is, is that 50 years has passed since Inuyasha was pinned. So, then the centipede attacks again, and now it's a lot bigger, this thing's like the size of a kaiju, this thing's the size of Manda, uh, which you're like, holy shit, we, they have no way to combat it, so... Uh, Kaede says, you have to lure her to the dry well, so Kagome goes to the well, um, and is being chased, uh, by, by the centipede thing, and for some reason this awakens Inuyasha from his sleep, and already he's fucking badass, uh, but he can't, he's stuck to the tree, he can't do anything about it, so Kagome goes down to the tree, and for some reason, uh, Inuyasha thinks that Kagome is Kikyo. And they already have their banter placed, and it's really good. This is some Han Solo, Princess Leia shit right here. It's your typical hero-heroine chemistry dialogue where they're being smart asses. Uh, the centipede attacks, and then Kagome is able to pull out the arrow and release Inuyasha back onto the world, who destroys the centipede, but then it turns out I'm the actual villain. Dun-dun-dun! End of the first episode. Leads us to the second episode called Seekers of the Sacred Jewel, where, as the title says, Inuyasha's is after the jewel. Which all actually turns out came from inside Kagome's body. Now, what are all these coincidences going on? You have Kagome shooting this energy shit. She's able to revive Inuyasha with both, like, un waking him up and unpinning him from the tree. She has the jewel in her thigh, 
or whatever, which is kind of odd. Um, and then, obviously, after Mr. Strong's centipede is defeated, and they take, they get the jewel out of her, um, all of a sudden, Inayasha wants the jewel and is constantly calling, uh, Kagome and Kikyo. Well, after a very hilarious scene where Inuyasha gets what's called the Beads of Subjugation, which are essentially these beads, he cannot take them off, they have a spell on them, and all Kagome has to do is say the magic word to get him to be obedient. And because he's a dog, what does she say? Sit. <laughs> Just like this puppy is right now. So, this is the running gag of the show, is Kagome constantly telling Inuyasha to sit. And he does, and it's always funny. It never gets old. It's one of those jokes that just never get old, and it's absolutely hilarious. So, the villagers are repairing things, and then we find out that Kagome is actually the reincarnation of Kikyo. Now, funny enough, this is the first time I've ever heard of reincarnation uh, watching the show, and I was like, that's a very interesting concept that the soul of the previous person goes into the body of another and kind of inhabits it in the same recognizable way. In a way, it's kind of what I wanted to see what the, them do with the new Star Wars Disney trilogy, where Rey wasn't obviously the daughter, of, the granddaughter of Palpatine. I would have thought it would have been more stronger if she turns out... He, she kind of was, but it's the same way Anakin was created through the Medichlorians, but in this case, she was a virgin birth who becomes essentially the reincarnation of Anakin Skywalker, a.k.a. the reincarnation of Darth Vader. Um, I think that would have been a much stronger story, so in this sense, Kagome is the reincarnation of Kikyo. Uh, and it's not just resemblance, but the powers that be which she's having a hard time uh, controlling, which is very odd. So, a few scenarios happen. Um, we also find out that... Um, other people are seeking the jewel. It's not just demons and monsters that inhabit this world. It's also humans. So, yes, the jewel is the One Ring of Mordor, <laughs> essentially. You know, it's all this shit kind of crumpled and evil in this giant little Dragon Ball thing. So, Kagome is captured by bandits, as, as there are. And then there's this one big bandit who looks like Andre the Giant. And, you know, he's kind of a zombie-like guy. He's walking very odd. He's swinging his sword around, killing all his men. Inuyashi comes in to save the day. And it turns out this thing is a zombie. Because inside, the goddamn Andre the Giant Bandit that is controlling him like a puppet is this fucking crow in his heart that builds himself a fucking nest inside him. It's so fucked up. So disgusting. This is like some... John Carpenter's The Thing levels of gore, and I love it. I love the creative designs and what these monsters and demons can do in this world. You have human, literal human centipedes. You have crows that build heart, that build nests inside people's bodies. That's like out of the fucking, like, it's like that, it's like the Jurassic Park Telltale game where the Trodons are able to, like, build their nest inside human hosts. This is some straight-up carnosaur shit. Um... Uh, honestly, if the bird turned out to be a dinosaur, that'd be great. There's dinosaurs in this world, but they'd probably be replaced for dragons. But anyway, so Inuyasha gets rid of the bird. The bird flies off, but takes the jewel. And obviously, Inuyasha and Kugel may have to go after this bird who's getting bigger and bigger. Um, in the meantime, they grab, you know, obviously an archery set for Kagome, which she's never fired a bow in her life, but because she's the reincarnation of Kikyo, Inuyasha assumes you can shoot this damn thing. And it's a really funny scene, because you expect this epic moment for her to unleash her power and fire it, um, trying to get the posture right. She fires it, and it goes, and then the arrow goes, Whoever did the sound work on this, in terms of the comic, comic comedic effects, it's great. So the bird captures a little boy, known to do, and uh, Kagome swims after the boy, saves it, but then the bird loses its foot. So what eventually happens is, is that Kagome takes the foot of the bird and attaches it to an arrow and fires it at the bird, which makes sense because that way the foot will be drawn to the jewel inside the bird, so it will obviously hit it. It works! They kill the bird! But Kagome accidentally shatters the jewel. And I'm not talking about two pieces. This thing's scattered all over the place. So there are about maybe 100, 200, who knows, as Kaede says, 100, 1,000, who knows. And it has, it's now it's become Lord of the Rings meets Dragon Ball, 
where this one jewel is scattered all over the face of the planet, or on not only not the planet, but the entire area of feudal Japan, and each piece can essentially double a demon's strength. So that's a big problem. This is a very big problem. This is the equivalent of the One Ring, I keep going back to that. Equivalent of the One Ring, instead of throwing it in the fires of Mount Doom, you just shatter it. Even a shattered piece is enough to corrupt somebody, so... There's whole kinds of trouble now, in, in Japan. So, now we have essentially our setup. You acquire your uh, companions, your weapons, and you go on your quest to collect all the jewel shards and hopefully reforge it, and then eventually destroy it. So that's essentially our setup for this show. It is a simple quest story. It's Dragon Ball, Lord of the Rings, kind of spliced together. So, obviously through these first two episodes, you have your setup, and then we get to our first villain, because this is essentially the first boss in any video game. So, we get to episode three, which is a very great title, I really like it, Down the Rabbit Hole and Back Again, which I always have to end with, A Hobbit's Tale by Bilbo Baggins. Um, so... It's also a play on words on the Alice in Wonderland story where Alice goes to the rabbit hole and then actually has to come back home. So, we find out more about, you know, the, the, the jewel and, you know, Kagome being the reincarnation of Kikyo and how Inuyasha sees Kikyo in her and it's a very subtle thing, but there could be something there that we don't know about. And we finally come across our first villain of the series, who is only in these two episodes, but makes a really good impression, Yura of the Demon Hair, who is essentially a s and uh, leather fetish girl who's obsessed with skulls and hair. Now, I want to point out, hair is scary enough when you get it in your food. It's disgusting. I've only seen a few times where hair actually is, comes off as terrifying, either in your food, or if you watch that ring movie where that girl pulls all that hair out, it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, it's like pushing, pulling out a fish hook. It's disgusting. But what your abilities are able to do is use human hair uh, as essentially like marionettes, like puppets on strings, and control people, and control uh, dead bodies, and basically cause ruckus. And she creates essentially a hair web all throughout the land. And it's pretty much for a first-time villain. Like, she's pretty in, she's pretty hard to cr uh, crack. She's a pretty hard nut, nut to crack, essentially, and essentially kill. Like, you can't figure out what her weakness is. So, these first episodes you introduce her, you're just like, oh my god. She's got the sweetest voice. She's got kind of a Harley Quinn sort of weird complex. And she's like, oh my, oh me. And you're like, you're, you're into some kinky fucking shit. And it's kind of weird. <laughs> she even goes up to Kagome and sees the jewel shirt. It's like, oh, you naughty, naughty girl. And you're like, Yura, what are you going to do with her? P please don't. Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, sexual tension to the show. You're just like, oh my god, but it doesn't go fully there. So, um, basically, Yura sends Kagome accidentally back into the well, and Kagome ends up back home. And she's apparently been gone for three days, so you, there's obviously a span of time that happens in between. It's not like Back to the Future where the time is instantaneous. Um... Which is weird. I'll get to the time travel aspects later on in the show. I just wanted to point this out. So, now uh, Inuyasha and Kaede are kind of on their own. The villagers are all under a spell, okay? And basically, Inuyasha has to go back and fight Kagome, goes through the well, and actually ends up in her timeline, which makes for great comedic effect in the first introduction, and has to take Kagome back, and they have to go back and destroy Yura. So, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I will say that overall, these first four episodes, actually, that was it, um, the fourth episode is just called Yura of the Demon Hair or something, I can't remember. Um, I think that's the name of the episode. But these first four episodes are a good impression to set up not only your main plot, but also the tone. Uh, because first of all, the plot is very simple. It is, you know, a quest story. It is a quest fantasy uh, related series uh, that takes place in feudal Japan. Even though I do question if it is feudal Japan, I like to think it's in an alternate dimension, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so you set up your quest, you acquire your weapons, you get your companions, and you go off and find what you need to do, your MacGuffin. Uh, but then you also have your first boss villain who makes a very good int uh, intimidating display. And then on top of that, the tone. This show is dark. Um, it is essentially a PG-13 show. 
But I find it odd because this show is essentially PG-13. It's dark, it's got blood, it's got swearing, it's got nudity. Uh, very mild nudity, mind you, but it's still displayed there. Yet, from what I gather talking to a lot of people who watch this, they watch this as kids. Now, don't get me wrong, not, I mean, look, kids can be exposed to some pretty fucked up shit. I mean, I was exposed to the never-ending story as a kid. T scared the shit out of me. I was exposed to Willow. I was exposed to a few not really appropriate for me films. Like, I saw Rob Roy when I was five, and that's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite, uh, historical epics. So, with Inuyasha, I mean, for me watching it personally, I mean, while Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball laid the groundwork in terms of, like, really getting me into anime, Inuyasha was very much a transition into adulthood for me, and the fact that I was pretty much the right age to watch it. A 13-year-old kid watching this in 2005, uh, every evening at 8.30 before I went to bed uh, for school the next day. But it's weird that kids watch this, and I imagine most of the kids were, you know, honestly, millennials. They were grew up, they grew up you know, in the year 2000 and, or late 90s, which you don't count as a 90s kid, I'm sorry. Um, 98 is where I draw the line. But anyway, so, you know, you have all this, and yet they, they watch this as kids, and I'm like, this is not a kid's show! Oh my god, who... How the, I guess the parents were asleep at that time, and the kids would probably watch it, the television, whatever. Um, it's weird, because pure YTV, YTV is a children's network, and they always showed it. But anyway, so the tone is very dark, and I really enjoyed that, too. Just its violent imagery, its swearing, the nudity. But again, that's just part of the content to essentially build up your tone, but it's not essential to the story. The main story is these two characters, Inuyasha and Kagome, and for chemistry-wise, as a team... At first, they obviously can't get along, but they work really well. Um, and so far, it's a great way to kind of set up your main uh, point of the story. You obviously also have your wizard companion, which is Kaede, who's, you know, very much like a wizard type, um, which is kind of cool. It's, often, it's not often you see female wizards in any kind of fantasy. They're normally witches, or they're like something from like Harry Potter, where they're like Professor McGonagall, um, essentially. Um, and yes, in these logs, I will definitely be bringing up more parallels with different fantasy elements and different fantasy stories. Um, but also on top of that, the animation is great. Uh, the, the painting backgrounds are fantastic. They really give a real grittiness and dirtiness to this world where everything looks used. It doesn't look clean. And I think because this was still early anime uh, prior to the digital realms uh, later on with most animes now that are way too clean. Uh, this had a really grimy feel, which I really enjoyed uh, in terms of rewatching this show. And but yeah, the animation's fantastic. I mean, this is by Toho, and Toho um, are known to do pretty good anim uh, and not just anime. They they create the Godzilla series, um, but they also are known to do pretty kick-ass uh, animes. Uh, obviously, prior to this, they also did the Kaiketsu Zoro anime, which I've really been enjoying. And on top of that, they did Akira. And I can see a bit of the color palettes of Akira a little bit in the series. And, again, really enjoyed that. Just that dark, gloomy, painted look. It looked fantastic. So, I'd say overall, the first arc, which I am calling the Yura arc, um, you know, or Yura and the Sacred Jewel arc, uh, or, or, no, I'll just call it the Origins arc. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think looking back on it, it's a good first impression. And it makes you want to see what happens next, especially when you get to that finale. Uh, it's a pretty interesting battle, to say the least, because there's all these different twists and turns that you don't expect. And it leaves you kind of satisfied, thinking, okay, let's see what the rest of the adventure is like. So, I'd give the first impression maybe about a maybe about an 8, an eight out of 10. Um, there are definitely better episodes out there that I will get to. But so far, for our first arc, four-part episode... It's pretty fantastic, and you can pretty much watch it as a film, essentially, because I think that whole arc was probably about a two-hour film in itself, which is great. So, there's my first impressions on the show. Of course, I want to hear from you guys. What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments below. And again, these are Patreon exclusives for first, so if you guys want to help support the show, just a dollar more will get you early access to all of our content, as well as other special features, um, and all your proceeds are going to go help our show, plus a potential Inuyasha fan film. Um, if you guys are seeing this later on YouTube, uh, tune in next time, uh, when we take a look at episode, uh, what is it? I 
I think there's like another four episodes, maybe maybe three. I think it's a three-parter. We're going to be taking a look at the Sashomaru arc, which introduces a very popular, probably one of the most popular characters in the show. Uh, so until then, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you guys later. This is Big Jack Film signing off saying, Sit, boy! I couldn't resist. Bye.